Okay, well, thanks for everybody for showing up. Thanks, Jim. Um, want to talk a little bit about Jim Ryder. When I, I think when I first became involved in the California Rare Fruit Growers, am I still on? When I first became involved in the California Rare Fruit Growers in the early 90s, Jim was, I was a newbie and Jim was one of the veterans. He was, you know, one of the old guard and was, you know, present at every sign exchange, every apple tasting, uh, well, maybe not that, but if you walked up to Jim Ryder, even though he was kind of, you know, the authority on apples, he would take the time, answer any question that you had. He, and over the years, you know, he's been providing apple cyan wood, pear cyan wood, apples for the apple tasting, advice to everybody. He's a super resource to our chapter. And I think we're incredibly lucky to have him <clears throat> just associating with us, but especially lucky to have him giving this presentation tonight. Um, so Jim, take it away. All right, well, thank you. And uh, I should, mention that some of the apples I make cider from have come from the Scion Exchange over the years. So it's always been a two-way street. So um, I'm going to try and keep this fairly simple. I'm going to um, not get too far into complications um, and try and get over, over what I think are the basics, a lot of which is, is my opinion, and it's perfectly okay for people to agree or disagree with that, um, but it's kind of what I know. Um, so I'm going to start with um, just talking about the apples first, and we're gonna go through the program kind of as I would make cider kind of step by step. Um, I will say I have lots of projects I'm working on, so I'm kind of a minimalist. You can read lots of suggestions of hundreds of different things you can do in terms of making cider. I try and do as few things as possible. And if that doesn't work, why maybe add something and rather than starting out doing everything one could possibly do and subtract. Um, so apples, the, the um, what we're looking for in, for cider is um, kind of a moderate acidity. Um, apples, when you eat an apple, um, you're looking for balance of sugar and acid. So some apples can taste balanced like an Ashmead's kernel that has enormous acidity, but also very high sugars. So it's maybe 40 bricks and, and real high acid. And it doesn't taste too bad, and it tastes actually complex and um, because there's both acid and sugar. The problem with making cider out of an apple like that is that the sugars are all converted to alcohol, but the acid doesn't go away. So if you make a cider out of uh, apples that are fairly high acid, it's going to be pretty acidic. Um, so, my kind of local favorites um, include varieties like Newtown Pippin, Spitzenberg, Golden Russet, Wix and Crab, Calville Blanc, Arlette, that have acid more or less in the, uh, in the range that uh, I'm wanting to start with. Um, other apples, I mean, those, those are varieties that tend to have distinctive, what I think are distinctive flavors. And, um, and then there's some others like Jonagold and Mutsu that make a, a well-balanced cider, um, but don't really have much distinguishing characteristics. 
Um, there's a few like Honeycrisp and Braeburn that are quite good as fresh cider, but when I've fermented them, um, I haven't been pleased with the results. I'm not particularly sure why. Um, there's a whole group of, of apples that are low acid um, and make ciders that aren't very good on their own. Um, and this is the case too of the uh, fresh juice isn't, I think, real good. If you make cider out of Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, Ambrosia, Gala, Hudson's Golden Gem, even Fuji, um, there's not enough acidity to give it much character. And so those, those ciders tend to be quite um, neutral and bland. And then there's a whole range of apples with high acid, um, some of which have made quite good ciders to my taste, but most people might find them too acidic. Um, things like Ashmead's kernel, carmine, pink pearl, um, any, most any of the red flesh, <laughs> um, hidden rose, rubiat, um, even Cox, Macintosh, Gravenstein. Um, some of those make juice with decent flavor, but they're all um, more acidic than what I would want. Um, so combining them with, um, with maybe some lower acid would give you a better, better starting point. Um, I always start by measuring the sugar with a refractometer because I'm kind of from the uh, apple production end of things. And we always think of sugar in terms of bricks. People who are home brewers, um, done beer, tend to use a refract, um, not a refractometer, but a hydrometer to measure specific gravity and they tend to think in terms of specific gravities rather than bricks. But there are tables which will allow you to convert the two. Um, you want to know what the, what the sugar level is of your juice um, because that's what will determine your alcohol concentration when you ferment it. Um, just as a kind of a gross rule of thumb, um, your your alcohol content will be slightly more than half of the bricks level. Um, so if you've got, um, say, 14% bricks, um, you might get seven and a half, eight uh, percent alcohol. Um, and if you do real high sugar apples, which some people um, like to play with, you end up, um, I mean, you can get 20 bricks on some ripe Fuji's. Um, Ashmead's kernel and carmine will go there. Wixen's will get up there. Um, and that can make cider with um, 10, 11 percent alcohol, which I don't find particularly attractive. I would rather drink ciders with lower alcohol, but that's really a, a matter of preference. Um, I like those four and five percent beers. I'm not a big fan of the eight to twelve percent alcohol beers. Um, if um, uh, one of the other things I've commonly done is include um, other fruits, stone fruits, or berries in a uh, in a cider blend. Um, apricot is particularly good. Um, raspberries, olali berries, um, commercial blackberries don't have much aromatics and really don't work at all. Um, but these are things I might blend with. Use something like Fuji that has high sugar and low acid as a, as a blend um, because the berries and most of the stone fruits have lower sugar and higher acid than apples do. 
uh, and will give you a pretty tart product if you um, if you don't blend it with. And I might use say three parts apple to one part berry or or fruit. Um, in Europe, most of the traditional ciders are made um, from apples that were selected specifically for cider production and they tend to have tannins. Um, we don't have many tannic apples here, although Newtown Pippin probably has more tannins than any of the other uh, kind of commercial or locally available apples short of growing the, the European cider apples. Um, one way to add tannins without having those specific apples uh, is to use crab apples. Um, most crab apples are quite tannic and a small amount will give you some tannin and increase the body of the juice. Um, so I've had pretty good luck throwing some, some crab apples in. More recently, I've been growing, um, or at least try to grow, uh, a number of French and English cider apples that are selected for their tannin content. Um, and I've grown enough to make some cider from them that's been, I thought, quite good. Um, but they're mostly quite difficult to produce. Um, they don't like our climate. Uh, they have longer chilling requirements than we have here. So it's been, it's been difficult to get consistent production out of them or particularly good quality. Um, I mean, as a typical example, Kingston Black is a famous English cider apple that's um, kind of well known. When I grow them here, they have very short stems. They set in tight clusters and, um, and they tend to push off the tree before they get fully ripe. So they might need thinning to get the best quality and that's not something people really wanna do for cider apples. Um, for for cider, there are some things you can do that you wouldn't normally want to do for, for juice. Um, like traditionally in a lot of areas, apples are taken off the ground for cider. Um, in England, cider orchards have very large trees. They graze animals under them. Um, they just pick the fruit up after it falls on the ground. Um, I don't really recommend that. Um, I prefer to use apples off the tree and I've always had availability of fruit off the tree. Um, it avoids a lot of the problems of um, off flavors from rots. And, um, and I think you eliminate a lot of bacterial contamination that you might end up with. It's, um, so I would, um, I would usually start with hand-picked apples off of trees, um, would wash them usually with a hose um, just to rinse them off. Um, I know I've seen people put them in tubs and wash them, um, which seems like might be just a way to spread any contamination from a few apples to many others. Um, so I don't think that's a particularly good idea, although if you are going to use fruit off the ground, um, washing them is going to be fairly important. Um, you do want to use ripe apples for um, cider. And um, a lot of traditional cider production involves picking apples and then letting them sit for a couple of weeks so that 
all the um, all the starch can be converted to sugars. Um, I don't think that's necessary here. That's more of a European practice where they have fairly cold growing season and some years don't get the sugar levels on the tree that they would like. Um, here it's pretty easy in most cases to leave the fruit on the tree until it's fully ripe. You have the most um, flavor development and then um, then you can cold store them for a while and, and make it when, the, when it's an appropriate time for you. Um, but I don't really recommend um, um, storing apples at warm temperatures to get starch conversion. Um, and it's certainly a very bad idea if you're drinking fresh juice. Um, some of the contaminants can be dangerous um, if you don't pasteurize it. And uh, I, I mean, the nice thing about cider is that the fermentation process uh, is fairly effective in eliminating pathogens. Um, that's why historically people drank alcoholic beverages in Europe because um, it was far safer than drinking the drinking water, which was frequently contaminated. Um, even uh, so the alcoholic fermentation process will eliminate a lot of the bacterial contamination and it's even effective in, um, in breaking down some of the fungal toxins that might be, might be found in the juice. Okay, so we've selected some apples, hopefully. Um, uh, I mean, there are, there are lots of places to get apples. I'm assuming as a group of rare fruit growers, many of you will have, are interested because you have unusual varieties and would like to see uh, what you can do with them. But it's certainly possible to buy apples um, to make cider as well. Um, And, you know, in some cases, maybe getting together a group would work. I, at one time I sold, um, oh, like three or 4,000 pounds at a time to uh, a couple of home brewing groups who, you know, split the apples, rented or borrowed a grinder in the press and, uh, and a whole bunch of people went in for a week, had a weekend party and, and, and made, made juice. Um, okay, so you've got your apples. Um, next thing you need to do is grind them up. Um, you want to do that in a fashion that gives you a relatively or sort of a medium course, eight to half to quarter inch chunks of fruit. If you mill it too finely, um, it kind of slimes over in the press and it's harder to get juice extraction from. Um, so generally uh, something that's purpose built for grinding apples is, is the best choice. Um, I've got a picture of a um, grinder I use that I think we can throw up on the uh, screen here with a, a speedle with a long yellow. There we are. <laughs> you can see that? Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> um, it's 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 a kind of a simple and elegant machine. There's a motor and uh, and spinning blades at the bottom. It's got a long tube, so you can't reach your hand down and hit the and hit the blade. Um, you just throw the apples in the top. Um, it's claims a capacity of something in the order of. 30 or 40 pounds a minute. So um, you could make a lot of juice with something like this. Um, it just pretty much will grind them up about as fast as you can dump them in there. Um, this particular machine comes from, um, from um, 
from Germany and it's got a 220 motor. So um, it might be difficult if you don't have a convenient 220 outlet to, uh, to use it. But there are other similar machines that are made with, um, with 110 motors. Um, so there are some, you know, there are some other things one can do also. I mean, I, if you want to make a couple of gallons, uh, you know, just a tabletop kitchen juicer would probably work. And I do know people who, you know, as a cheaper alternative, mount a garbage disposal on a tabletop. Um, and um, you can do a fair amount of, uh, uh, of juicing that way for, you know, with a hundred and something dollar um, garbage disposal, but it does make a, a, a finer grind than, than would be optimal. So I think it reduces your yield somewhat doing that. Um, there are also hand grinders um, that you can buy for a couple hundred dollars that are, um, this, this one runs about a thousand dollars and I think similar things are kind of in that neighborhood. So you might be able to find a hand grinder for a couple hundred dollars or somewhere in that neighborhood for, um, and then there's, you know, if you can find old presses, um, that could be interesting too. So let's, um, if we could throw up the next pictures of the, uh, um, there's several different kinds of presses one can use. This is what I use. It's a, uh, it's a bladder press that runs off of water pressure. So you just hook it up to your garden hose and it's got a balloon inside that blows up with the water pressure and pushes the pushes the pumice to the sides. Um, in my experience, it's fairly um, efficient in terms of yielding more juice than I formerly had a, used a basket type press, which is, you know, the one you always see on the logos of wineries, which is kind of a basket with a screw on top. Um, those, um, might give you two, two and a half gallons from a 40 pound box. And this one could give you closer to three gallons from your typical bushel of apples. Um, and then the other, um, particularly if you're getting into a little larger production, the other system is called the rack and cloth, where you use um, wooden racks, um, and then fill a kind of a cloth bag um, on top of the rack, then put another rack and another cloth bag full of pumice, and you build up these, what are called cheeses of, of, of uh, maybe two inch layers of pumice with, with racks in between. So that, um, uh, you you don't have a big mass like you would in a in a basket press. You have smaller masses, and so the uh, um, the uh, yield is 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 better. Theoretical yield is you know is somewhere around um, four gallons out of a forty pound box would be you know, the maximum theoretical yield, nobody's going to get that much, but to give you an idea what um, uh, commercial presses can do somewhat more, they usually use uh, pressing aids like rice hulls or wood chips to keep the, um, keep the pumice open and keep channels open in the pumice so the juice flows out better. Um, particularly important with some varieties. Red Delicious and Gala are very hard to press um, because they, they make kind of a slimy um, uh, pumice that, that seals off. 
uh, and you you just can't push the juice through the that kind of that outer layer. There is there is a fair amount of difference in different um, in different apples and in different size apples what your recovery might be. Um, frequently, juice apples are apples that work suitable for other purposes, and a lot of small apples uh, get made into juice, but your recovery is much better from large apples than small apples. Um, very small apples are mostly skin and stems and seeds and core. Um, so if you have, have um, very small apples, your, your yield may be quite low. I've pressed some crab, small crab apples and um, you get very, very little juice out of them. Um, okay. I, I, think, so I think that covers for, uh, the, pictures on this topic, at least with the press. What's that now? You have uh, <clears throat> this picture. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I forgot about this one. This does show um, that's the balloon. Um, so these are, these are designed to use up to 50 pounds of water pressure. Again, you just hook it up to a garden hose. Um, put the basket on there, fill it with pumice, um, turn the water on, and uh, that balloon blows up and pushes it against the sides. Is there another one too, or is that the last? Okay, this is just another view of the same thing. Um, yeah, I think that's okay. it for the, the, the pressing stage. Oh. Okay. Um, so now we have juice. Um, what do we do next? Um, if you read a lot of the uh, uh, literature on uh, particularly the kind of the uh, directed at amateurs or directed by people who are selling uh, supplies, um, it sounds like you have to do a lot of things uh, before you ferment the juice. And uh, um, my experience, that's neither necessary or desirable. Um, most commercial producers use sulfites to help kill the bacteria in the juice before adding yeast. Um, but um, in my experience, it's really not necessary. I've made hundreds of gallons of juice and have very rarely had anything not um, or get, you know, <clears throat> um, ended up with vinegar or some lost um, or undesirable product at the end. Um, and you have some decisions to make as to whether you want to do a um, just a wild or natural yeast fermentation. Or, um, or whether you're going to add yeast. Um, it's safer to add um, yeast. Um, most of those strains are selected to start rapidly and, um, and kind of dominate any fermentation that goes on. So, um, so, if you if you um, do an added yeast, I've you know I've gotten fermentation going rapidly. If you have warm temperatures, it can complete fairly rapidly. Um, there are people who would argue that the lower temperatures and the slower you ferment, the better. And there are certainly people who advocate using um, just the wild natural yeast. Um, uh, for fermentation. 
And I have done that. I don't generally do it anymore, um, but it's fun. Um, it's interesting. You never know quite what you're going to get. Um, and sometimes it's quite good and sometimes it's not so good, but um, it's, it's an interesting variation. It does take longer um, with a wild yeast fermentation. Generally speaking, what's happening is you're, is you're not having one dominant yeast, you're having a succession of yeasts. Uh, and what starts fermenting first may die off at 2% alcohol and hands it off to some other um, yeast and, and you may have a succession of things. And so the argument is that you have a more complex um, um, yeast or biological activity so that you can get um, some different flavors. And I think that's more or less true. Um, but again, it's, um, it's a bit of a gamble um, in that um, you don't know what you're going to get. And if you're looking for consistency, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to really know what's going to happen with that. Um, there are, you know, indications that before people had commercial yeast additions that a lot of cider makers or winemakers had consistent um, um, results in their production because um, the yeasts were um, on their wooden equipment, in their wooden barrels, you know, hanging from the cobwebs and the ceiling of the barn and so on and so forth. So that if you made the same juice in the same barn year after year, um, you might over time end up with a fairly consistent and distinctive um, yeast strain that was different than what your neighbors uh, would use. Um, not many people do um, wild yeast fermentations on a, on a commercial scale because of, um, you know, the expense if something doesn't turn out right. Uh, if you're doing a gallon, you know, it doesn't turn out, why no great loss, but if you're doing 10,000 gallons, um, then it's a bit of a risk. So most commercial uh, producers would use sulfites to somewhat clear the slate and then use their preferred added yeast to get a, a consistent product from year to year. And that may or may not be what you're looking for. Um, you can add yeast nutrients. I haven't really seen a need for it. Some people add pectinase to get the juice to clarify earlier. I don't think that's really necessary or particularly useful. Um, and, um, you can actually buy acids and tannins and all kinds of other act, additives. Um, I had a friend who took a class from an English consultant for, on, on a more commercial basis. And their whole thing was, well, whatever apples you had, you made your base cider. And then you took it in the lab and you tested it. And then you added sugars and acids and tannins or whatever to get it to taste like what you want. And then you bottled it. But I don't think that's what, <laughs> that's what folks here are looking for. And um, again, I, um, I just make the juice. I generally add a yeast strain. Um, and um, and kind of walk away and let it do its thing. And it's been quite successful without too much difficulty. You have a lot of choices in yeast. Um, when we first started uh, this, um, I did 30 something gallons of Newtown Pippins um, in one gallon containers and put 30 I think it was 32 yeasts, one a different one in each gallon, and then we 
tasted them <coughs> um, after they were done. And um, it's a daunting task, but what we did was set up, um, I think like 16 pairs. Nobody can taste 32 ciders and remember which one they liked best, but everyone um, can taste two ciders. You know, you, you put them in pairs and do you like A or B and you keep them blind so that no one knows what they're tasting. Um, and that, that, that worked pretty good and we got pretty consistent results, generally speaking. Um, we had a fair amount of agreement <laughs> among different tasters. Um, but yeah, it'd be like a tournament. So we would do 16 pairs and then the eight winners would get uh, in four pairs and then you would just go on until you had the uh, final, final winner. And so in our trials, um, uh, some of the better yeasts were, um, we had pretty good results from some of the liquid cider yeasts, which are more expensive. Um, they're made by White Labs or Y yeast makes English cider uh, yeast. And, and so that's, that's been a consistently good performer, um, but they're also substantially more expensive yeasts and they require refrigeration, have a limited shelf life. Um, so we also got very good results with uh, a couple of white wine yeast, D47, Cote de Blancs, that's a real common one, W15, QA23, we used one called AWRI350, that's Australian Wine Research Institute. It, it was, I was using that because I read that that's the uh, standard yeast they use at the uh, Long Ashton Experiment Station in England um, for all their trials. Um, so all those work. Um, a lot of people like the champagne yeast. Um, it's a, they're very vigorous fermenters and they're sometimes used if you ever have a stuck fermentation to get things going again. But I think it makes a kind of accentuates the acidity and most or many of my ciders have more than enough acid anyway. So I tend to not use that. Um, but I do like to use one called 71B1112. It's one that reduces the acidity uh, somewhat. And um, if you're using something that's really on the, on the side of high acidity, I think that one's very helpful to kind of smooth it out a little bit. Um, I also use that for um, apple berry, apple apricot, things that tend to be on the tart side. Um, So it's, um, um, at this point, it's also a good time to, to check the, uh, the, uh, either the specific gravity or the bricks of your juice. Um, you can test the acidity with um, um, just a little test kit you can buy from wine supply places uh, or home brewing. Um, stores that use sodium hydroxide and, and um, phenolphthalein as an indicator and you put drops of juice in to get the color change. And so that, that can give you a pretty good idea of what your acidity is. It's kind of a pain to do it on everything, but it, it could be interesting um, um, to do. I did it on quite a few varieties to kind of get an idea of where they were, um, but I don't normally do it every time. Um, a lot of people like to check the uh, pH. Um, the pH is, is, uh, is a measure of acidity, but it's different than titratable acidity. Um, 
you can't taste pH, but pH is important in terms of um, the uh, likelihood of, of bacteria growing and things going wrong. Um, if you have a very high pH like four, um, it's far more likely that you would have problems um, than if you had a pH of three or in the low threes. But remembering that's a logarithmic scale. So uh, a three is 10 times as acidic as a four. So if you're using sulfites, um, it is important to know the pH because the amount of sulfites to use is determined by the pH. Um, you need to use more if it's less acid. Uh, okay, now our juice. So we're going to ferment it. So we need containers to ferment it in. And I think we have some photos of... Um, um, so this is, this is the simplest, particularly on a small scale, is gallon jugs. I still do a lot of stuff in gallon jugs because they're fairly easy to handle. They're reasonably easy to clean. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. Um, and I just like to try lots of different things. And, and so I'm more inclined to to um, do lots of small batches instead of, you know, um, 10 or 20 gallons of one thing. Um, glass is, is great. Um, it's it's um, durable and easy to clean and easy to sanitize. Um, a lot of the success in making cider, um, I think um, deals with how well you are at washing dishes. Um, everything should be clean. Um, and um, I generally use a, a sanitizer that um, most of the brewing supply places sell called StarSan uh, to, you need to keep a wet solution for one minute and it's a, a pretty good biocide. Um, it does have a danger label though, and you wouldn't want to, it, it's something you need to be careful how you use and it causes, can cause eye damage. So you want to read the directions and, um, um, and take precautions uh, with it, but it's a very effective sanitizer. Bleach can be used also, um, but you need to be very careful about rinsing it. Um, the star sand doesn't, they, the recommendation is that you not rinse it. So you, you keep that residue on there. So it seems like it's not a problem to eat it, but splashing your eye, splashing it in your eyes could be a, um, a rather dangerous situation. Um, you're, you still have to have the bottles clean though before you sanitize them. If there are, if there's any kind of uh, particles or debris or something stuck in the bottles, why well, then the sanitizer is not going to be effective on that. There's also, let's um, look at some of the other possible containers here. This is a, um, HDPE, high density polyethylene, I think. Um, these are um, hard plastic that's designed for aging wine or cider. Um, but in general, um, you wanna be careful about using plastic containers. Um, um, they, they're not made for that purpose. They can, they can create, um, um, off odors or flavors, and uh, they may not be impervious to oxygen when you're trying to keep oxygen out of them. Um, so if you're using plastic, go with something that's specifically designed uh, for the purpose of making fermented products. Um, let's, and then, 
you can see the fermentation locks uh, on top of the containers of different styles. Um, it's um, so when you're fermenting your juice, you you basically want to have a check valve on top that will allow the CO2 that's being formed as a product of the fermentation to escape without allowing any oxygen to get back in. Um, so the water allows the CO2 to bubble out, but doesn't allow anything to come back in. So uh, when you're fermenting your, your, your juice, um, you need to keep it under a fermentation lock. And um, for your initial fermentation, you don't want the tanks quite as, or bottles as full as these are in the pitchers. Um, this is more for longer term storage after initial more rapid fermentation. If you fill the containers that full to start with, then you'll have, um, you'll have a volcano. Things will um, push out the top and kind of make a mess. So you, you want to do, with your initial fermentation, you have rapid evolution of CO2 and that protects the, uh, um, the juice from exposure to to air. Um, red wines, they ferment them in open containers for the first uh, few days. And, and just the, the fact that they ferment rapidly and have a basically create a layer of CO2 on top. Um, but if you have longer fermentations or you're, you know, in some cases, if I start late in the season and the temperatures are cold, it may not finish fermenting for several months until spring when temperatures warm up again, unless you do them in a heated building. And in that case, you want to have your containers almost completely full so that there's as little exposure to oxygen as, as, uh, as possible. I probably should say here too that um, this is a good time to, uh, you know, when you're adding your yeast and, and, um, and starting your fermentation, um, that's when you need to get your pencil and paper out and record exactly what you did and when you did it and um, what your apples were, what your, um, what your bricks readings were, um, and so on and so forth. Um, if, if you, it's just important to take good notes if you want to be able to understand what happened and, and, uh, and make changes in the long run. Um, so there's, and this is just another, another type of container. Um, you can also use, uh, lots of people use six gallon, five gallon glass um, carboys, um, but they're heavy. Um, if you wash them, they're slippery. Um, and it's, it's um, a lot of people have dropped them and uh, um, had some kind of dangerous situations where broken glass and, um, and, and they're pretty heavy. So, and they're also very hard to wash and get a long bottle brush and so forth. So these containers with a bigger lid um, are, are for me easier to deal with and easier to handle, um, particularly the, uh, like the ones with handles on them and so forth. Um, so, okay. Um, so a lot, a lot of people uh, are uh, advocating doing very long, slow uh, fermentations. And that's somewhat traditional in Europe uh, in particular, because by the time the apples are ripe, it's quite cold. And so the fermentation would essentially not complete till the following summer. Um, and then, um, and of course the people who do it that way say it's uh, more traditional and better and you get more complex flavors. And maybe true, I don't know. I've kind of done both. Um, 
as opposed to say your commercial your your volume commercial producers are are doing a very different thing um, instead of making one batch a year in the fall uh, they're buying concentrate um, it's more like a, a beer brewery you do a batch in 10 days uh, you move it on you um, bottle it you bring in more concentrate um, put more water in and and do another batch and so you you don't maintain a lot of inventory so it's a much cheaper system than than making it once a year and uh, and then uh, working off of that, that inventory for a long period of time. Um, I generally find that it takes uh, a certain amount of time to, for, the, uh, for the juice to clarify. Um, so if I, I've done stuff in August at times that ferments to completion quite quickly, um, but it may take several more weeks for it to really uh, completely clarify. Uh, generally cold temperatures are an aid to clarification. Um, I mean, theoretically you can filter it, but that's not something anybody really wants to do on a home basis. Um, so, the idea is to uh, ferment it until you get it to um, to basically zero on a final um, uh, on a uh, hydrometer reading, um, and there is a final gravity hydrometer that's made just for as a very narrow. I think there's a picture of it. If we uh, those are those are the fermentation locks. This is a device. Those are that's a for bottling. That's a siphon. A, a self starting siphon to, um, and there's your uh, hydrometer. Um, and you notice that has a very tiny um, um, top piece so that the, the um, differences between the numbers are, are, are well spread out. You can't really read it, but um, uh, divisions there are like between, um, uh, just, I don't know, just um, very fine divisions. It's hard to tell when you've reached zero if you've got a, a hydrometer that goes from zero to, um, to 60 or something. And, and so you want one of these final gravity hydrometers. Um, and actually I broke this one when I took the picture of it. You do have to be very careful with them. Um, but you, you're, you know your fermentation is done when you get down to a little below zero. It actually goes below zero because um, um, alcohol is lighter than, than water. Um, so a complete fermentation would be just slightly below zero on that. Um, and that's important. Um, if you're going to bottle the cider, um, if you do have residual sugar left in, um, then um, you can um, you can re you can end up with a problem of um, particularly if you uh, if you use corks, the uh, the cider can still be fermenting and push the corks out. If you use crown caps like a beer bottle. Um, there certainly are a lot of people who have blown up bottles over the years and you don't want that to happen. Uh, and even if it doesn't go that far, you can end up with a situation where when you take the cap off, you end up with a geyser instead of um, something that you can pour in your, your glass conveniently. Um, and then once it's completely fermented, then you have another decision to make as to whether you want to do a carbonated cider or a still cider, um, so you could um, you could bottle it into say wine bottles with a cork or uh, or more any kind of a bottle um, as a still cider. 
Um, I find that most people prefer carbonated ciders, um, but there's, there's kind of disagreement about that and it's kind of a personal choice. Um, there's a group in England that's advocating for um, only still ciders because uh, traditionally cider was never carbonated. Beer was, but um, cider was basically fermented to completion and sat in barrels uh, for the remainder of the season while it was being consumed. And um, in, in fact, carbonated cider is a relatively recent innovation. Um, although there are people in England who claim that um, they carbonated uh, cider before the uh, French made champagne and that's where they got the idea. Um, so the next um, step would be to bottle it. Um, I generally use, I prefer to carbonate most of mine. So I use beer bottles. If you can um, um, beer bottles are almost always brown, it would be better if you could find clear bottles. Um, uh, some people use uh, used uh, Corona bottles and you can soak them in muriatic acid and it takes the label off. It's a lot of work. Um, it's pretty easy to buy um, new beer bottles uh, from brewing supply places uh, or you can um, save your bottles and scrape the, uh, scrape the labels off or whatever you choose to do. Um, it, it does seem at times that um, if you get a deer, deal on beer, you can almost buy the bottles uh, full for about the same price as the empty ones. Um, so that's always a consideration. Um, so to carbonate cider, um, it's a lot like the champagne process. Um, there's various ways to do it. The simplest though, is just to add a measured amount of sugar. Um, and most people use corn sugar or dextrose that's sold by all the home brewing uh, stores and that's what beer brewers typically use. It's supposed to make finer bubbles than regular sucrose. I, you know, whether that's true or not, I don't really know. Um, and so for a typical beer bottle, uh, the amount of sugar to use is uh, four ounces in a five gallon batch, eight tenths of an ounce per gallon. Um, and that will give you the level of carbonation that beer bottles are designed for. Uh, if you want higher carbonation, you can go to champagne bottles. And a champagne bottle is a, a much a uh, heavier built bottle. And so you can use roughly twice as much priming sugar and get higher carbonation. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun with the higher carbonation. Again, it's just kind of a matter of choice, um, what you like. Um, I think if you are going to store it for a long time, Doing it in larger bottles is probably a good idea. Um, the crown cap, um, you know, that's used on beer bottles is really not designed for long-term storage like a cork would be. Um, but I have some that are eight, 10 years old and still seem to be fine. So um, that's probably too long to keep this stuff anyway. Um, so I, I don't know if, if you really wanted to, um, to store stuff for a long time, then you, you need to buy champagne corks and, and wire them down, that kind of a thing. Um, and then you have the, uh, the same kind of a system as champagne. With champagne, you turn the bottle upside down and bounce it up and down to all the yeast, uh, because this carbonation is created by 
yeast that's still in the cider uh, working on the added sugar and that's what creates the carbonation under pressure. Um, some people in fact add some yeast when they do this and I've never found that to be necessary. Um, but, um, and, and if you really want to do a champagne style, then you turn the bottles upside down. So the yeast goes into the, into the neck of the bottle and then you freeze the neck and then you eject that part and then you fill it back up again. Um, and then you get um, kind of clear champagne in the bottle. But um, I think it makes, it's a lot simpler just to um, quit pouring before you get to the bottom of the bottle and, uh, and let it go from there. Um, and then it's time to drink it. Um, there are, if you're serious about, you know, keeping track of your efforts and, and uh, there are quite a few um, score sheets for cider that you can find on the internet that, um, that are probably helpful in giving you a list of things to, to kind of look for and, you know, categorize the uh, different, uh, uh, put numer numerical scores on the different characteristics. And uh, I think I did, maybe we should go back to a couple of pictures there of um, kind of glossed over the uh, bottle filling, but I did have a picture of a, a tube with a bottle filler on it. It's just a little valve on the bottom of a, of a, of a tube that, um, okay, that's a siphon, that's used to, I did, okay, that's the bottle filler. So it's got that little point on the bottom and you push it down and the juice comes out or the cider comes out. And then when the bottle's fill, full, you lift it up and it quits and then you go to the next bottle. So that's a real, um, um, saving of time and energy uh, and filling the bottles. Um, the other device there was a siphon and I, I did kind of miss that point though, is that um, sometime in that aging process, um, you would generally want to rack the cider off into a clean uh, container. So um, the initial fermentation, couple of weeks will put a lot of uh, sediment on the bottom. And it's a good idea to rack that off into a clean container and using a siphon is, is the approved way to do that. You don't want to expose um, the cider to air any more than necessary. So siphoning it above the sediment layer and then running a tube into the other container so that you're not splashing um, so that the tube is is remains under the the, the uh, cider level in the in the container you're going into, um, so you're not splashing cider or uh, you know basically um, introducing a lot of air into the mix. So I think that's about all I have. Um, if we want to move on to questions, so yeah, we got. I... Uh... Quite a few, and I can uh, start us off. Thanks, thanks a lot for, for talking. Um, Irene asks, uh, what about blending in autumn olives or berries into the uh, apple cider? Um, I don't really know um, about autumn olives. I mean, we've certainly used berries. Um, I mean, I've used pineapple guava that made an interesting cider. And uh, um, if you have um, uh, passion fruit, I think that would make an interesting flavor. Um, commercially flavored ciders um, seem to be uh, pretty common right now because the juice that's available for people to make cider off of um, with in volume tends to be pretty neutral product. Um, so um, 
if you, and I, I guess I should talk a little bit about sweetening cider too. Um, uh, that's another thing I didn't really cover very well. If you buy cider, uh, commercial ciders, they're all heavily sweetened. Um, that's difficult to do at home because if you sweeten it, then the yeast will convert that sugar to carbon dioxide and blow your bottles up. Um, so to, to do a home sweetened cider, you need to pasteurize it. Um, which is, in my opinion, not any fun. Um, you can't really put enough sulfites in to kill all the yeast. Um, so um, sometimes that works. I mean, sometimes you can make the cider and refrigerate it for a few weeks as a sweetened cider. Um, but my recommendation is if you want a sweet cider, um, you should uh, you should make some simple syrup. And when you uh, when you open your bottle of cider, if it tastes a little acidic, you pour a little a little sugar in to get to what you want, and then drink it. Um, and I I don't know. I'm not a fan of. Uh, sweet drinks in general and uh, sweetened cider, I, I think is um, not something that I would want to drink, but it's, um, it certainly does appeal to a lot of people. So um, yeah, I don't know about autumn olives, aren't they? Um, aren't they fairly tannic? I don't know. Yeah, they, they tend to be somewhat astringent. Uh, so they might they be a good sub in maybe for crab apples. Yeah, you might want to start with very small quantities to start with to see how that uh, how that works. Um, but um, you know, um, things you could potentially use as blends, uh, you know, are kind of um, uh, limited to your imagination. Um, I mean, we've done nectarines, peaches, uh, pluots, plums. Um, most of those are not as popular as the apricot. Um, berries, raspberries work well because they're very aromatic. Um, and I think actually a combination of olalis and raspberries gives you kind of depth of flavor and the aromatics. Um, olalis are, have, have a, have flavor, but very little odor. Raspberries have lots of odor and less flavor. Um, if you have Willamette, I think, you know, or Tulamine or some of the uh, more aromatic raspberries, I think those would be, would be good choices. Um, but I think most of the commercial blackberries um, you know, would give you a beautiful color, but I don't think they would add much in the way of flavor. Um, we have another question. Uh, Stuart, information on the availability of Basque cider varietals? Um, they are starting to be available. Um, Cummins Nursery in New York um, has... Um, Oh, I don't know, Coloradona. Um, they have four or five that uh, um, that come from northern Spain. Um, they're not very commonly available in the U.S. at this point, and um, I have some of them. They have not fruited yet, so I don't really have any recommendations. They might have lower chilling requirements than some of the English and French varieties, which haven't, haven't been good producers here. So it's, it's interesting, but I don't really have very much information, uh, but you can get them. Hmm. Another question from, uh, what are you concerned with regarding contaminants on apples if fermented? I don't wash so that I can preserve the native yeast. Um, 
I think it's pretty difficult to actually wash off the native yeast. Um, uh, from what I've read, a lot of it would be down in the calyx end. Um, I, um, but um, I don't really know. I mean, I've never, you know, um, I've never tried to thoroughly wash fruit like, you know, putting in a chlorine solution or something like that. Um, you know, if you're the pool guy, maybe you know how. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, uh, just hosing them off isn't going to um, really uh, remove all the, all the yeast. Um, and, you know, and if the fruits, I, I don't know. I mean, I think hosing them off is mostly for aesthetic purposes anyway. It depends on where you're located. Um, here, um, I'm out in the middle of major agricultural areas. And so there's a lot of ground preparation going on in the fall. So my fruit tends to be dusty and the dust washes off pretty re readily. Um, if your fruit's not dirty, I wouldn't, you know, I'm all in favor of not doing anything more than what you need to. Um, so. Um, Ellen had a question about the cost of your grinder, which I think you said was a thousand. Thank so both the grinder and the press are about, a, are about a thousand dollars a piece, roughly. You can buy smaller presses. Mine is, um, does about, um, what is it, 40 liters, 10 gallons, roughly. Um, and um, I think you can buy one half that size for somewhat less money. Did you, did you know which uh, brand the grinder is? The grinder is a Speedle. Um, S-P-E-I-D-E-L, it's made in Germany. And the, the press is Speedle also. And so are the, uh, so were those fermenters, the, the plastic uh, containers. Um, I got all those mail order from um, More Beer that's located in Concord. They have some retails. They have three retail stores in the San Jose. Well, I think there's Los Altos, um, Fremont, and Concord. Um, but they are, um, well, at the time I bought mine, they were the only place in the U.S. that sold that one. I think there are other, um, other places to get it now, but... Um, um, that, it's also, I mean, they started out as kind of a more of a beer growing, home brewing, and now they've branched into beer and wine. But it's a good website if you just want to look at or you know all the potential supplies and all the equipment that's that's available. Um, uh, the only problem with that, again, is that it's two twenty, and if you don't have a convenient two twenty outlet. And even if you do, it probably doesn't have the same connector that um, whatever you happen to have. So you might have to build a, um, I mean, I, actually that's what I ended up doing. Um, I, I had 220 in my shop, so that was convenient, but um, the plug didn't match my outlet. And, but so, and it comes with a fairly short cord anyway, so I just made an extra 10 feet of cord and put plugs on each end to, to go from <laughs> what I have to what it was, and it was fairly inexpensive. But there is an Italian uh, machine that's stainless steel, and um, uh, you used to be able to rent them in Santa Cruz, um, and, but that, what was it, Seven Bridges or whatever, they went out of business. And um, so I don't know, um, again, I think internet search might turn you up. Um, that one's, I think, runs on 110 and might be more convenient for most people. Um, one of the questions about the press was um, about the pressure. So, uh, you know, what's your water pressure? Do you need any especially high water pressure to do nothing? No, and, and as a matter of fact, they're set so with a pressure regulator. So if the pressure goes over 55, ever over 50, 
it just dumps water out. So it's a maximum of 50 pounds is what they're designed for. Um, okay. You know, and if you didn't have 50 pounds, I think it would work, but you're probably better off at, at around 50 pounds. And then uh, Jim's asking, you know, what about a food processor? And then I, I had the question, you know, I have a masticating food processor or a juicer, you know, is that something suitable for, for kind of combining these steps of grinding and juicing or grinding and pressing? You know, I, um, I, I haven't tried fermenting, um, uh, let's, let's go back and say, so if I, you know, if I had a machine that just, um, you know, you threw the apples in it, grinded them to, ground them to pulp, I might be inclined to ferment it first, kind of like you do red wine grapes, you ferment them and it breaks down a lot of stuff. And then, um, and then you, you know, and then you get most of the juice is free run and, and press kind of what's remains. Um, yeah, I don't know uh, whether it would make more sense to, you know, put that in a cheesecloth bag and then squeeze the juice out or whether, whether you could just ferment it first and then, um, and then press it later to separate the pulp out. Um, I had, um, I had just a tabletop juicer, but it had kind of a screen. It was pretty inefficient in terms of how much juice you got and, and particularly how much juice you got for how many hours of work. Uh, but it did make juice. And, and if you, you know, just want to do a gallon or two, it makes, you know, I mean, those are relatively inexpensive and available. Um, I mean, in the past, the, the equipment's usually been rentable. I don't really know right now. There is a home brew store in um, Seaside is the closest one. Um, I think it's called Bottoms Up. Um, it's mainly beer brewing, but um, um, that might be a possibility. Um, people who brew beer seem to really like the place, but um, I don't know what your options are. Um, um, Pete's asking, apart from off flavors, are there good bacteria on windfalls, a sort of terror? Um, I don't think you really want very many bacteria working in your cider. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, um, you put a little dirt in there and you can taste the soil type that your trees <laughs> were growing in. Um, I'm not real sure. I, I I think if I were going to do windfalls, um, I would uh, go out and get one of those uh, nets that they use to harvest olives, stretch it out on the ground, and, uh, and then pick the fruit up off of that um, and kind of try and minimize the amount of dirt in them. Um, it's... Um, but... You know, again, if you see some of the things they do in England, um, pick up fruit, some of them pick up fruit with, you know, I mean, it's mechanical means. I, I've seen fruit things that use little spikes and pick up the apples and poke holes in them and throw them into a, into a container. Um, um, but yeah, most of them it's picked up mechanically off the ground floor that maybe somebody grew raised sheep or cows in sometime earlier in the season. Uh, and, and people seem to get away with it. So, um, but then again, people in England, you know, consider a barnyard a, a, a positive attribute of, <laughs> of cider. So um, I, I don't know. Um, I definitely wouldn't do that if you were drinking fresh juice, um, but 
it's uh, it, that is you know one of the advantages of making cider is that you can use apples that you really wouldn't want to eat okay um <clears throat> another question from greg do you use a uh, sorbic acid to rinse the star sand residue no i haven't done that is that supposed to uh be beneficial i don't really know the star sand the label says to not rinse them, to leave the residue. And, um, and I don't know, I am have mixed emotions about that frequently. Um, I will rinse them out, but I haven't heard that one. I have tried using ascorbic acid to um, to see if it might help retain color in red fleshed apples, but it didn't seem to make any difference. Hmm. Um, Darren asks, do you have any experience with fermenting finely ground apples before pressing? And if so, were there notable results with this process? No, I, uh, I again, I haven't done that. Um, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how that would work. I mean, I, I've certainly done, um, you know, wine where you essentially uh, crush the grapes and throw them in a bucket and it looks just like a bucket full of grapes. But as it starts to ferment, um, then it breaks down the skins and the juice separates and then the thing you have to do with that is to punch it down regularly because all the the skins and seeds will go to the surface and make a cap. And um, at least with wine, you want to keep that uh, pushed down under the liquid so that you don't get uh, molds growing on that and, and create off flavors. Um, so that might be you know, I really don't know whether that stuff's going to float or sink to the bottom, to tell you the truth. <clears throat> um, but if you got a, you know, a thick cap of, of pulp floating to the surface, I think I might be able, I might be tempted to follow the uh, winemaker's uh, uh, routine of, you know, every four hours pushing it down underneath the uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, with wine, you're doing that to increase the contact with the skin. So you're trying to get tannins and things out of the skins. And mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe you get, might get some interesting flavors by having it more in contact with the pumice for a longer time. Yeah. Um, another question, we had a little discussion on this. Do you, um, I've put alcohol in my airlocks, um, like, you know, vodka, for example. Uh, do you recommend putting water in your airlock? Uh, I put I put a solution of uh, star sand um, so that you know that if um, if you do end up with something going back in that it's sanitized basically hmm. um, but I don't know I'm I don't know whether that's a good idea um, if you're doing a lot of bottles, uh, that vodka thing could get expensive. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I don't know, that would work. Um, I'm not convinced that you need to do that, although um, I have seen, um, sometimes you end up with a lot of fruit flies around in the fall and, and uh, you'll go in and check your fermentation locks and they will have critters in them that have drowned. So, you know, it's, um, you don't really want that stuff being sucked in. And it can be if you have, um, uh, if you have temperature variations. I mean, if you have 80 degree nights, uh, I mean, days and 40 degree nights, um, during the day, the cider or the wine or whatever will expand and push out. And then at night, it will suck, suck stuff back in. So it, it would be it'd be much better to have fairly uniform temperatures so you don't have a tendency to suck stuff back in. A uh, question from Reed, can you comment on target bricks for 
um, picking apples? Um, I can comment on it, but in terms of useful information, probably not so much. Um, BRICS is a useful indicator of maturity uh, for apples, but each apple variety would have its optimum uh, bricks. And so um, if you're, you know, if you don't know what you're looking for for that particular variety, um, it's not necessarily useful. Um, some like Pink Pearl or a lot of the early apples top out about 12. Um, and um, I mean, we used to have, um, couldn't legally pick Red Delicious before they hit 11 or something. And I think in Washington, they could pick them at 10 and a half, but that's not gonna make you, that's not something you would want for cider. Those would be minimum maturity. Um, You know, I would say you should pick them when the apples taste good. Um, <laughs> and um, it's kind of subjective, but, and, and probably, and certainly you can leave them on a lot longer than if you were going to put them in storage and try and keep them for a few months or, or so forth. I mean, um, I don't think there's, um, you know, it, it kind of optimum eating quality off the tree. You're not going to have a lot of starch yet to be converted. Um, so, I mean, that's not a very scientific thing, but I mean, just as an example, um, Newtown Pippins um, kind of depends on the year too, but you know, if you're up 14, 15, 16, that's about as much as you're going to get on that variety. Fuji's, um, you can get them more up to 18. Um, I guess say Carmine and Ashmead's kernel, those things can hit 20. Um, um, okay. Um, um, it's, it's asked, you know, if, if the bricks is too low, would you add sugar to adjust it? And if so, how? Well, um, um, yeah, you can um, raise the bricks by adding sugar. It's, um, and that's not an unusual thing in Europe, apparently. Um, um, they talk about some seasons in England where they have trouble getting more than 10 or 11 bricks on fruit because they have a short season. And if it's cloudy, um, they just don't get the, uh, the sugar that we could develop here. Um, there's um, generally not much excuse here for not getting um, pretty decent sugars. We have such a long, mild growing season um, and you can hang fruit on until December in most years. Um, and and I, I mean, something like um, if you want to use um, Randy Smith, for example, um, you know, hang them on there until December when they turn yellow. I mean, it really is a yellow apple that's marketed immature uh, by tradition here, um, particularly since Northern climates can never get it ripe, um, but we can get it fully ripe here, but it's, um, I've left them on to Christmas and they're really good at that time. Um, and, and then you don't have that high acidity either, so it, it would work. Um, question from Carol, do you put your apple pulp into a bag while fermenting? Um, the, well, we, we press it and separate the pulp and then only ferment the juices. That's what the purpose of the press is for. Um, um, but again, I think we've talked a little bit about, you know, that maybe there would be ways to, to ferment it first and, and press it afterward, but I haven't done it. So, um, anybody's guess. Um, Reed's asking for cleaning, is Alconox ever used? Usually 
used for cleaning sampling equipment in environmental cleanup sampling. What's it called? Alconox. I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. I mean, there are other sanitizers. Um, I, you know, Star San, I think is by far the more commonly used one. They also make, same company makes one that's iodine based. Um, but um, there are a lot of different um, sanitizers. Um, it's just, um, I end up buying most of my supplies from uh, beer brewing supply places, and that's the most common thing they have available. Um, Reed also had another uh, interesting question, which is, would chapter folks be interested in the cooperative purchase of a grinder? And I guess maybe the better question is, uh, where would people interested in making cider in this area go to to, uh, you know, try it out, try out the grinding and uh, impressing? Um. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Um, um, you know, and where would people get apples? Uh, I think um, um, there may be people who would, you know, be willing to sell somebody a couple of bins or a couple thousand pounds of apples. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure who right at the moment. Um, but um, yeah, I know the, the Redwood Empire chapter, I think, has a at least a grinder. I don't know if they have a full press and everything, but I think they yeah, have um, Redwood Coast Brewing Association. Is that Red, Redwood Empire chapter of CRFG? Oh, a CR, okay, yeah, okay. There's a Redwood Coast Brewing Association that also, I think, may have their own equipment or rented, I don't know, but. They, they, they used to buy like 4,000 pounds a year from me and then, you know, and then share the costs and stuff, but I don't, you know. Um, okay, a few more questions um, from Greg. It says, I've seen uh, commercial East Cider apply cold glycol to soft fermentation. Is there a home cider maker's temperature chart for dry or is it? Back of garage, the place to have gradual ceasing of yeast consuming sugar is better to ferment dry. Well, um, um, it, it is possible to stop fermentation by cool temperatures, but generally that's done in a stainless steel, uh, water jacketed, uh, fermenter with, you know, refrigeration equipment. Um, it doesn't really get cold enough here to, um, well, I don't know. And then it's still not stable. I mean, it stops it, but then unless you, um, you know, cold filter it or pasteurize it, as soon as it warms up, it's gonna, it's going to ferment again. I, I have actually tried to stop fermentations or tasted stuff that was partially fermented. And um, I have not been impressed. Usually um, it doesn't taste very good <laughs> until, um, e even when it finishes fermentation, um, I think the flavor improves dramatically. And a lot of times off flavors can go away if you store it for, for a few months before drinking it. Um, it's real common to have um, kind of sulfur odors at the, um, at the end of fermentation. Um, but if you let it sit for a while, those will usually go away. So I, I'm kind of in favor of aging it a bit and uh, not um, question from Bob, how long do you leave juice in the primary fermenter before racking it? Um, depends on the temperatures, but a couple of weeks, something like that. Um, um, you kind of want to wait long enough till it starts to kind of settle down so that when you 
put it into a new container. You can put it very full uh, and leave little airspace and not have danger of it, you know, bubbling over. Um, I'll, I'll kind of close this with one last question that Greg had and I'll expand on a bit on it myself. Uh, is there a go-to apple cider that shows the general quality of traditional U.S. apple cider? Uh, in my bar, restaurant, nightclub, there was a lot of demand for Angry Orchard, but I find it way too sweet. That was Greg's question. I guess my other question is, you know, what, uh, what local cider should we be trying and which ones would you recommend? Well, wow, there's a good question. I, um, uh, I mean, there are some local cider producers who are using local apples. Um, I haven't um, really drank enough <laughs> of them to be um, really able to give a, a, a decent recommendation. Um, I mean, I will say I'm in complete agreement that 90% of the commercial products are um, you know, they're, they're basically soda pop with alcohol in them and they're kind of marketed as such. And, um, and I don't like them at all. There are, um, there are some producers in the U.S. who are, who are making um, dry ciders and uh, um, you know, certainly some, um, you know, I guess I, I just don't know enough, um, I haven't consumed enough to really be able to give anyone recommendations, um, but um, there's, um, there are some interesting ones in, in the, uh, in Vermont that are, you know, growing English cider apples. And I think that's the, doing some interesting stuff. Um, but, you know, we don't see, they're not distributed here. So uh, these things, you, you tend to read about things that seem interesting, but actually finding them in the store is somewhat difficult. But I guess I'll have to go out and uh, buy some of the Santa Cruz ciders and give them a shot. <laughs> I haven't, uh, haven't had many. <laughs> yeah, you got to test them against your own. Um, right. I had a few comments here. Uh, Tilted Shed was one of them. Uh, Eye Cider. Um, Stuart says the same maker as Radio Pito. And then Freddie says Tanuki has made some really good ciders. So it sounds like there's a few comments in the yeah. I got one last question coming in. Uh, Enrique is asking, can you please repeat the short list of locally available apples that are well-balanced and good for making cider? Um, yeah, um, locally grown. Um, in terms of uh, available, that's, that's a, um, it's difficult to find any of these things really, um, other than maybe at uh, farmer's markets and so forth. Um, I think over the years, I've had more success with Newtown Pippin than anything. And it's also one that's held up in aging. You know, I've had ones that are um, four, five, six years old that I thought actually got better. And um, generally, people will say cider is not designed to be aged and that. Uh, uh, it should be consumed fairly quickly and it doesn't really get better with age. But I think Newtown Pippin is one that I've had some really nice ones that are old. Um, Spitzenberg, you may be able to find that at a farmer's market. That's another one that's done really well for us. Golden Russet, I don't think you're going to find many at farmer's markets. It's, a, it's an old American apple, but mainly grown on the East Coast. Wix and Crab. Um, surprisingly, I mean, it seems just like a tiny sweet apple, but it's made surprisingly good juice. But, you know, they're tiny. Um, uh, even growing them, um, I'm not sure I'd want to grow them and have to pick them. 
<laughs> it's, uh, and I, I really haven't looked at, you know, what the recovery would be. I, you know, a couple other ones I've used this Calville Blanc, but, you know, I don't know anywhere where that would be available other than growing it yourself and Arlette. Um, John Gold makes a creditable cider, though. It's not quite as, um, what, distinctive as some of the others, uh, but it's got a nice balance, and that's an apple that probably is available at farmer's markets, maybe. Um, and... Um, uh, yeah other varieties. Um, those are kind of the ones, I, I've made some really nice um, uh, ciders out of Cox and Rubinette, but you know, an Ashmead's kernel, but those are also apples that I don't know where you would be able to buy those. They can certainly be grown here. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, uh, I think that's more or less all the questions. If anyone else has any questions, please stick around to ask. Uh, but if you guys want to unmute and give Jim a big thank you and a round of applause. Um, thank you. A lot, Jim, for, for talking Woo! to us. And... <laughs> thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Appreciate it. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. Um, Again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, speak up and, and uh, ask. I'll leave everything open, but we'll, uh, this will be the formal end. Thanks, Jason. Great job. Okay, well, I guess we... Hey, um... Jim, this is, this is Carol here. I'm curious okay. to know if you have experience with any of the European cider apples that grow well here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> okay, so um, the ones that have grown the best here for me are uh, Porter's Perfection, um, Major. Um, it's not a very long list. Nehu, N E H O U. Is very productive. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, let's see. I mean, I, I probably got a longer list. I didn't put those in front of me, but probably got a longer list. The ones that don't do well here. I mean, like I had Stoke Red that didn't even leaf out this year after growing last year, and um, but I've. I've made actually, I thought quite good cider just by taking whatever I have from a, you know, like a, a bunch of trees and throwing it all together and, and fermenting it. And it's, it's kind of worked. Um, you get the tannins. I mean, what, what we really need here is the, is the ones that are, um, that are low acid, and high tannins. It's kind of an unusual combination, but um, most tannic apples, I mean, certainly where I'm, you know, my breeding program, virtually every tannic acid is insane, a tannic apple is insanely acidic as well. And so, um, especially a lot of the red flesh are both tannic and acidic, and that's just not a good combination for cider. Um, if you have, um, if your acidity is too low, we have a million things we can correct that with. Um, so if you're looking for English cider varieties, I would concentrate on the ones that have kind of <laughs> low acid and a fair amount of tannins. Thank you. Sweet. Is that what that is? Yeah, I mean, bittersweets. Um, I mean, Kingston Black is, I think, classified as a bitter sharp, but it's not terribly sharp. Um, I mean, I think, 
Um, in, in England, they would have trouble fermenting straight bitter sweets um, because the pH would be too high and they would have problems with uh, contamination and bacterial uh, growth. Um, and they couldn't, um, they would have to blend them. The amount of, of um, uh, sulfites they would have to add wouldn't be legal to actually um, sanitize those. Uh, the sulfites are much more effective at low pHs. And so, um, so they would have to blend that with, uh, well, we would too. I mean, we, but anything we have would be fairly acidic. And uh, um, so I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have, I'd have to look at some of the lists to see what they are, but uh, um, that to me, that would be the most valuable would be the ones that, that have low acid and, and a higher amount of tannins is that that's what we would want to throw in with any of our blends. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Well, um, no more questions, uh, then I guess we can uh, call it a wrap. All right. Very good. It's been fun. Thanks, Jim. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Everyone for coming. Okay, thanks.